We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome, welcome to our annual Dynamic Coalition on Small Island Developing States um, Roundtable. This is our, I can't remember if it's our fifth, but it's certainly quite a, we're moving well with our roundtables and I would like to welcome all of you um, today. Those who are on site, I know we at least have one person on site, June, who is in Poland and she's, uh, I know she's freezing in Poland. Hi, June. I'm not sure who else is on site, um, but welcome whoever's in that room. And we have quite a few people uh, online. Welcome all those who are online. And this is, as you know, the hybrid approach. So everyone is being treated equally, whether you're on site or you're online. And given that we are, majority of us are online, we may have a bias to those who are online. So let's see how that goes. So welcome. Um, I'm Tracy Hackshaw. I'm one of the the co-chairs or coordinators of the DC SIDS. I'm joined by my um, colleague, Maureen Hilliard, who is my fellow co-coordinator, co-chair. Hi, Maureen. Hi. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, that's all right. Yes, I'm going to, what I'm gonna do is quickly get to it. So I'm going to share my screen just to show you the planned agenda, if I could find it. I think this is it, yes. Um, just let me know if you're seeing this. I've lost the screen. Are you seeing my shared screen now? I can't see it. Yes, we can see it. All right. Good. Um, so as you can see, I'm just doing the welcome now. Um, I'm going to quickly toss to Maureen, who will do the welcome introduction. Then we're going to have, um, because our Pacific colleagues are really, really, it's really early for them. We're going to ensure that we get the Pacific agenda dealt with as quickly as possible in case these, our colleagues fall asleep. <laughs> and um, so get them, get them dealt with. And um, then we hopefully will have our Caribbean um, interventions. And of course, as usual, we will have our um, discuss, discussion on the various issues. So this is a fairly informal and unstructured approach. As you know, we normally take it like this. And um, based on what happens in the discussions and the reports, we're going to be um, dealing with the issues as they come up. So without further ado, let me toss back to Maureen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, hand over to Maureen. Maureen, go ahead, take it away. Thank you, thank you so much. Kia orana, everyone. Um, so good morning, good afternoon and good evening, um, wherever you may be. It's sort of like interesting to sort of uh, hear where, you know, there's lots of um, online participants, which is just fabulous. Um, thank you for being with us today. So my name is uh, Maureen Halyard. Um, I'm from the Cook Islands um, and I'm a former member um, uh, and, and chair of the board of the Pacific Islands chapter of the Internet Society as you can see. Um, and I'm currently the chair of the at-large advisory committee of ICANN and I serve on several um, boards and um, uh, committees related to the internet, but particularly to do with domain names. Um, my role, my role is pretty minimal, but it's uh, to, at this time, to introduce you to um, the speakers that we have from the Pacific, who will speak on activities that we've been engaged in within the Pacific region during 2021, um, despite the pandemic, and very much related to, um, you know, our theme, which is, you know, the, the um, to do with the pandemic and ensuring that the um, small island developing states aren't left behind. So without the benefit of any face-to-face -face meetings, you know, we've been very fortunate in the, uh, in the Pacific Islands, uh, Pekaisok, um, and that we've worked very hard to maintain dialogues with each other by way of an active mailing list, which all PICISOC members are enlisted to on becoming uh, registered uh, members of our, um, of the, um, of our ISOC community. Um, and 
one of the things that we've sort of like often spoken about with respect to the dynamic coalitions is, you know, like how do we maintain contact with each other? And I think that this mailing list has enabled um, our members to network, but also to participate in conversations and discussions on whatever topics of interest are raised and discussed by members from across the region. And this is this happens continually uh, during the year. So while we've not been able to meet in person, uh, the internet has provided us with a means of continuing contact and dialogue uh, between our members. Uh, and today um, I have with me, and I'm very, very pleased to be able to introduce some wonderful guests um, who are going to, um, you know, who have had a significant impact on internet development in our region. And um, especially during this time of the um, pandemic. And um, my first uh, speaker is uh, going to be Sheree Langakali, who is from the Fiji Islands, and it's one, one o'clock in the morning for her. Um, and she's the Pacific Liaison um, to the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise, the GFCE. She's also on the advisory board of, uh, of that organization as well. But tonight she's speaking as the chair of the Pacific Islands chapter of the Internet Society and will give an overview of the um, PIC-ISOC activities during 2021 and no doubt mention um, our Pacific IGF. Um, but uh, there is, you know, so uh, she'll be able to give an overview of, of sort of like what's been happening in our region with regards to um, uh, our, our membership of our Internet Society. Um, our, our second um, speaker is, uh, I guess, a, a, a special guest, Andrea Giacomelli, who is the Trade Policy Advisor for the, this lengthy, a, a very, very official uh, 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 title, but Pol Trade Policy Advisor for the Permanent Delegation of the Pacific Islands Foreign Secretariat, which is based in Geneva. Uh, the uh, Pacific Islands Forum Sec uh, forum is um, a group, is the um, regular gathering of the leaders of all its the member countries uh, from around the Pacific who make decisions relating to their 2050 strategic plan for the Blue Pacific Continent. And um, Andrea um, has been part of a, um, a very exciting Pacific e-commerce initiative, uh, which came about after more than six months of public consultations, which included the full range of stakeholders required to discuss how we might implement a more effective exchange of goods and services across the Pacific, um, something that is only done with a great deal of hassle, um, you know, involving currency exchanges, online purchasing, delivery of goods across the region. Um, the Secretariat, in Geneva and Fiji work on behalf of the um, Pacific Islands Forum leaders. Um, and they, you know, I, I, we're very honored to be able to have Andrea with us during um, this session um, because, it, you know, to get, to get um, an update on, um, on this important initiative and sort of like what development. So thank you very much, um, Andrea, for being um, with us. Um, I know that I was sort of like hoping we might have a, another speaker uh, from the Pacific Islands Forum. I'm not quite sure if, um, uh, because it is so it is so um, uh, early in, in Fiji, but I, I know that she is, I, there's no just in the list, she's here. Um, and this is um, Elise uh, Tuka, who is from Fiji as well. Uh, another long-term uh, PIC-ISOC member um, and who in 2005 established the Women in ICT Research section and Cherie has very successfully re-established this group and it's very active today. Um, Alicia is the, um, oh, she was first of all the CEO of the Pacific Islands private sector organization for several years before she um, moved to the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, where she's the program officer and team leader of the private sector development section. Um, she, um, you know, she will be able to update us on some of the other IT uh, developments uh, that the forum is engaged in with regards to the, um, their strategic plan. 
And we have another speaker um, at, um, at the, the final of our formal speakers anyway from the, from the Pacific. Um, and this is uh, uh, our current Pacific IGF MAG member, Dulce Baniala, who is from Vanuatu. Again, a very active, has been very active in the Pekai Sok um, area, and we're very pleased to be able to have her with us. But Dulcie was the former telecom, radio communications, and broadcasting regulator on Vanuatu. And I believe she's the only Pacific woman to have had this role in our region, and she's absolutely amazing. Uh, she now shares her knowledge and expertise um, uh, relate in relation to telecommunication and regulatory issues right around the Pacific as a consultant. Um, and, uh, you know, she's been found to be very valuable in what she knows and what she can offer um, a lot of our uh, Pacific nations. So we're very pleased to have Dulcie with us this evening and to update us on IC ICT issues related to her work. So I'd like to thank, you know, before they even start, thank to thank um, our Pacific um, participants today for um, you know, taking time up at, at a, an ungodly hour of the morning for them. But um, you know, thank you so much. But all these speakers are very, you know, will be um, the work that they've done is very much aligned with the topic of our session today, which is to ensure, as I said, that small island developing states do not fall behind during this pandemic. So. Um, I'll start off then by, I'll pass the floor over to Sheree, whom I also neglected to mention, um, has just been appointed to the IGF MAG for this upcoming term. So she'll be joining um, Dulcy and others within the Pacific who've actually been in this role. And it's very important that we have the Pacific voice um, in, in, in the MAG. Um, and I, June, had, I know, has it been very active for the Caribbean. And I think that that's, you know, we're very fortunate in um, having, um, having these wonderful people uh, representing us um, in the IGF. So um, over to you, Sheree, for your update. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Tracy, for having me. This is my second roundtable discussion. I remember presenting like this about exactly a year ago. And um, uh, it, it is 1 a.m. here in Fiji, so please forgive me if I do fumble in my update. Uh, Fikai Sok actually started this year on a high note uh, after a series of what we called e Kalanoa discussions last year. Uh, these were online uh, virtual Zoom sessions with uh, um, topics that were selected by the community, um, topics of uh, you know, following issues and of relevance uh, to the community where we invited speakers and we just, you know, just had these sort of roundtable informal discussions. Discussions. Um, and then because uh, we had received chapter funding uh, from ISOC, we were able to um, send out funding and support um, some of the activities that were happening on the ground in some of the Pacific Island countries. So we sent funding to the Vanuatu ICT Day um, that, was, that was held in May. We also helped uh, send funding for the Girls in ICT Day that was held in the Solomon Islands by the Women in IT Solomon Islands. And then uh, Tonga Women in ICT relaunched later this year and we were able to send funding for that. And, um, and then we had, like Maureen mentioned, we had Pacific IGF. And Pacific IGF had about uh, 637 registrants from about 36 different countries. We had uh, nine in-country um, hubs, what we call them. Uh, seven of these hubs had about, it was a four-day event. So seven of these hubs had uh, as much as 100 participants uh, at a time. And uh, we had the the Pacific IGF session had about 124 speakers with 2,041 uh, minutes of content. And uh, some of the takeaways from uh, the Pacific IGF was the need uh, to have more of these discussions uh, to bring the community together um, for, for co conferences, for discussions, for engagement. And in fact, um, there has been a lot of that. Um, you know, Fiji has been on lockdown for about six months uh, and there's been, we've only just opened to travel on the 1st of December. Um, but uh, internet, you know, the, the best thing about uh, being on lockdown was that uh, the internet survived the lockdown here in Fiji, uh, which was amazing because uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, fa families had to 
adapt to working from home. And then uh, we had to get used to, you know, Zoom calls uh, and, uh, then and schooling online. Uh, Fiji was not as practical as uh, Samoa and uh, Tonga last year when, we, when the pandemic first hit and Samoa and Tonga took their school and education program content and, you know, they put it online. Uh, Fiji had a little bit of catching up to do. And so there was a lot of Zoom calls, for example, for me, I have uh, a five-year-old and an 11-year-old. So in the morning, I had four sessions for the five-year-old and then I'd have to wait and have an hour break before I had another one-hour session for my 11 year old and then I had to adjust to getting myself to be up at night when they were sleeping so that I could do some work so it was pretty hectic and um, it, around the region itself there has been a, a lot of uh, um, co collaboration uh, discussions that were you know the certs and uh, we're having you know remote remote sessions online training uh, they are well, through Paxon and there was even a regional collaboration of certs uh, through the um get you know get smart pacific program and uh cyber, cyber safety pacifica was also doing pacific um police you know online safety sessions with police in country um, while fiji was on lockdown the rest of the pacific island countries uh, you know they were still open uh, still going to work although they did not have international travel um the tonga had uh, a little bit of a scare sometime uh, just recently with the you know the, the some cases coming in from Christchurch, but it was only like up over four days, and so business was on as usual in the Pacific Island countries. And one of the things that the Pacific had to juggle with was there was if 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 you know the today's topic being ensuring that seeds don't fall behind. That you know that was something uh, that uh, the Pacific did not suffer from. In fact, there were so many online sessions; it was hard to keep up. There was a lot of there was pretty much a clash of online sessions. You know, you're coming out of one session, going into an another session, and people were suffering from Zoom Zoom fatigue. You know, uh, people were probably sitting in front of their uh, computers all day long, uh, and it it was. Uh, it, it it was a little bit worrying if you think about it, because now that travel is is probably going to normalize. You know, the pandemic is not going to go anywhere. Uh, and so, like for example, if if, if uh, Pacific Island countries take the example of Fiji, then we're we're ninety five percent vaccinated, and we've opened our borders. And there's they opened to to some of the green countries that we call in the green list. And so, travel is going to be allowed. And uh, we're probably going to come through a situation in 2022 where there will be a clash of online events as well as in-country events. And we're probably going to have, you know, uh, people coming to do uh, do work in Pacific Island countries. Uh, at the same time, uh, Pacific Island countries will have to uh, probably split their teams. Right now, they're splitting their teams between online sessions. Half the team is going to this session, another half is going to another session. And, uh, and we're looking at in 2022, there might be a situation where a team has arrived from, a, you know, one of these uh, countries that uh, that implement things in the region and uh, the, you know the teams on the ground in the Pacific Island countries would have to figure out are they going to accommodate the people who have shown up or they're going to have to attend the sessions that uh, they have registered for online, um, which is something to start thinking about for next year. Um, with uh, PKISOC, at uh, we <clears throat> for with our board members, you know, we've had to juggle with, like I mentioned, working from home, um, being at home, uh, juggling family. Um, we were also, you know, we got lucky. We got to be a part of the e-commerce roadmap that Maureen discussions that Maureen had also mentioned that was being organized with the Pacific Island Forum. Um, uh, through my role as the Pacific liaison for the Global Forum Cyber Expertise. This in the past two years, I was able to help facilitate for bringing uh, the Pacific together for a Pacific session. Uh, as the Pacific liaison, I have been analyzing and scoping for a potential GFC presence in the Pacific. And uh, there is a GFC Pacific hub for cyber capacity building coming in 2022. And uh, we've just last week, we had a Pacific session uh, 
um, what we call it, uh, cyber capacity building hour. What is your recipe uh, for effective cyber capacity building in the region? Where, where, where there were experts from the region, from the Pacific, um, now Asia is also part of it. Uh, just talking about um, what are some things that they've done uh, that they found successful to, to implement programs on the ground. Um, also, the for next year, 2022, in fact, this week, we've just been confirming uh, PICISOC has received grant funding from the UNDP for a, the, a first of its kind Pacific Civic Hackathon to be held in February 20, 23rd, 2022. And uh, just today, uh, we've just been, we've just received verbal confirmation from uh, the University of the South Pacific. Uh, we, you know, we partnered with the University of the South Pacific for Pacific IGF in September, and uh, we've just received confirmation that you know they're keen to to collaborate with us uh, to provide the venues, as well as uh, support for having a hackathon since they've done one locally before, and so we were we're looking forward to that. Um, uh, you know, uh, Pacific has not fallen behind. Uh, we've actually been focusing a lot on a lot of things in country. In, the, in Papua New Guinea, they've been, you know, we're working on their legislation, um, launching their digital transformation bill. Um, Samoa recently launched this search. So, so there's a lot of focus in country. And uh, yeah, we're pretty excited about uh, what's about to happen in 2022. Um, looking forward to it. Also, also just, you know, at the back of your head worrying about how is everybody going to juggle trying to do things in country as well as adjust to online learning and uh, collaborating? Well, uh, I think that's it from me. Thank you, Maureen. Oh, thank you so much, um, Sheree. Well, obviously, um, and it's and it's it's only when you sort of like get to um, hear it, hear what's going on. Um, it's very, it's it's very, it's very exciting. Um, and of course, looking at um, you know not leaving. Um, uh, anyone from SIDS, uh, you know, let, think letting them fall behind. And I think that Andrea's uh, new initiative is definitely uh, one of those sort of like opportunities that the, is, that's being offered to the Pacific. Um, and it's, you know, I, I you know, I've, I've always been sort of like really, uh, really interested in the initiative once it was uh, established and, and, um, and promoting it within the region. Um, so, I mean, I didn't, and I know that these things don't happen overnight. So, you know, like, I mean, you know, so that progress, you know, for whatever it is, it's really, it would be really good to sort of like for, for, for people to sort of like hear where, where we're up to, Andrea, with regards to this initiative. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you, Maureen, for your nice introduction. And uh, uh, like Sherry was saying, just to remind us that uh, uh, COVID pandemic is uh, is not gonna leave us. As you can see, I'm wearing a mask because since uh, um, uh, since last Friday, the Swiss government has imposed uh, mandatory use of mask back again in office. So yes, we can all concur that this is gonna stay for a while. Uh, but uh, as my uh, predecessor was uh, referring to, uh, and also uh, same way as the agenda refers to, whereas uh, uh, COVID has uh, impacted uh, negatively on uh, many aspects of uh, Pacific Islands, it has also presented opportunities uh, to, um, to increase uh, uh, the use of uh, electronic means in our day-to-day -day transactions. I was uh, reading the latest report of uh, uh, PTI uh, business uh, survey, uh, which is conducted monthly and which was uh, showing uh, uh, a significant increase, for example, in the percentage of businesses uh, which use electronic means to sell their goods and services. Uh, whereas at the beginning of the pandemic, we were at around 12%, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, nowadays, uh, in the latest survey, 35% of businesses uh, responded that they were using electronic means uh, to support uh, their, uh, their sale of goods and services. Uh, so uh, that reminds us with that, uh, you know, with, with any uh, challenge, uh, then we, we always have also the opportunity side, uh, not to lose track of, because that is where, uh, you know, the future lies. And uh, for as far as uh, uh, my uh, brief update is concerned, I'm, I'm, I'm very 
uh, glad. It's a pleasure to, uh, to, to, to join this, this forum and provide some brief updates on the Pacific e-commerce initiative. Um, as, the, as the region premier uh, political and uh, policy organization, the Pacific Island Forum main objective is obviously to help its members uh, to overcome their national constraints by promoting some forms of uh, collective action. Uh, I'm sure we can all agree that the benefits from collective or regional action are the greatest uh, whenever an issue requires a sufficient scale to be addressed. And there is no doubt that scale is required in many aspects of uh, electronic commerce. Uh, for example, we can think about e-payment system or even e-commerce platforms. So this is certainly one of the reasons why uh, in 2020, uh, Forum Trade Minister decided to include uh, e-commerce as one of the four priorities of the Pacific Aid for Trade strategy. Uh, the other reason, I believe, is also linked to the uh, development potential of e-commerce, especially for uh, a region like the Pacific, but also the Caribbean, uh, with their small population, which is dispersed uh, over hundreds of islands, which are scattered, scattered across uh, a vast uh, ocean space. So by reducing the need uh, for physical interaction, e-commerce obviously has the potential to address some of our most binding constraints. And in fact, uh, for, cert uh, for certain industries, uh, electronic commerce can completely eliminate uh, the problem of distance. We can think, uh, for example, to the business process outsource outsourcing industry, uh, certain type of cultural activities, and even certain segment of the tourism sector. I've heard, for example, even in the, in the, in the, in the, in the tourism industry, uh, not necessarily in the Pacific, but uh, during the pandemic, uh, interesting forms of virtual tourism started mm. with personalized, uh, personalized way of doing tourism online. Um, so uh, the Pacific e-commerce initiative, which was established by the forum members back in 2018, is the forum attempt to increase the region readiness to trade electronically by promoting, by promoting targeted uh, collective actions. As of December 2021, uh, under the umbrella of this initiative, uh, national e-commerce assessment uh, have been undertaken in 11 uh, forum island countries. This diagnostic assessment, uh, which are freely available on our website and are based on a methodology developed by the UNCTAD, have informed the subsequent development of a Pacific uh, regional e-commerce strategy and roadmap, a strategy that uh, uh, PICSOC uh, representative and Mori uh, in particular have uh, strongly contributed uh, to develop. Uh, now, the Pacific uh, Regional E-Commerce Strategy Roadmap is the document embedding priority collective actions to improve e-commerce readiness, and as such, uh, represent a true agenda for regional change. Uh, this agenda was endorsed by our members in August this year, after having benefited from input by 174 stakeholders and validated at a workshop attended by around 250 participants. Now, uh, leveraging the UNCTAD uh, methodology, uh, the Pacific Regional E-Commerce Strategy and Roadmap prioritizes regional measures in seven policy areas, which includes uh, national e-commerce readiness and strategy formulation, ICT infrastructure and services, trade logistics and trade facilitation, legal and institutional framework, electronic payment, payments, e-commerce skill development, and access to finance for e-commerce. Uh, in total, the strategy identifies uh, 54 priority measures, including one specific measure, which is very much related to, uh, to the work of uh, PIC uh, SOC, which is uh, the establishment uh, of a Pacific, dot Pacific domain, something that uh, we will have to look at in the following months. So in total, I was saying the strategy identifies these 54 priority measures, uh, which are costed uh, at around uh, US dollar 55 million, excluding uh, the cost of infrastructure related measures. Now, uh, after approval 
of this initiative after this journey, which has started with the diagnostic and which is now uh, culminated in a regional strategy. The Pacific e-commerce initiative is now entering its uh, second phase, which is obviously focused on implementation of the regional strategy and roadmap. An implementation framework of the Pacific regional e-commerce strategy and roadmap is being established at, at this, in this very moment to ensure that the strategy is duly monitored, the resources for its implementation are mobilized, and uh, that partners are coordinated and the regional ownership is maintained. As part of this implementation framework, the PIFS is in the process of, establish, of establishing an e-commerce unit with resources for, from like-minded development partners. I do expect that the unit will be up and running uh, by the second uh, quarter of next year. Uh, the Pacific Island Forum uh, Secretariat is also implementing in this very moment some projects which are aligned with the measures recommended by the regional strategy and roadmap. This includes the development of a Pacific e-commerce portal. Uh, second, the development uh, support to our members to develop national strategies, which are based on a methodology which is aligned with the strategy that we have used uh, for, the, for the regional one. And thirdly, we are currently preparing a regional training program on e-commerce for Pacific negotiators. Uh, these uh, activities of the Pacific Island Forum are in addition to all the other activities that the many partners of the uh, Pacific e-commerce strategy and roadmap are currently implementing to support e-commerce readiness. Uh, now, by the end of 2022, we should have developed the first annual report on implementation of the Pacific Regional E-Commerce Strategy and Roadmap. And obviously we will be happy to share further updates at this important forum, if you would like us to do so. Uh, with this, I thank you. Thank you so much, um, Andrea. And um, of, um, of interest to um, the ICANN people, um, it was, you know, uh, Andrea mentioned that uh, uh, it was uh, uh, suggested that uh, Dot Pacific, uh, which is, is, isn't currently um, allocated yet, but uh, that Dot Pacific may be uh, an appropriate um, domain name to be used with, you know, for this uh, for this initiative or for the the forum uh, Pacific Islands forums um, to actually have uh, to um uh, consolidate a lot of their initiatives under under a um, Pacific um, domain something to look forward to but um moving on then uh, we uh, don't want to use up too much too much more time but um we've got um, uh, um first of all Dulce uh, Berniala uh, who is our uh, our mag member and I uh, just just looking through the chat there's been some interesting news um uh, just in the chat um Dulce but um um, I'll leave it up to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Maureen, and thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, very good. So, uh, first of all, um, yes, I have been a member of MAC, but uh, my term has ended in 2020. Um, however, I am still involved in many of these internet forums, including Asia Pacific uh, Internet Forum and the Pacific Internet Governance Forum. And um, I also want to contribute and update everyone on what and where the regulatory in the Pacific are heading um, in terms of internet governance. So I think in, in my observation and uh, my experience in the last three to five years, it was kind of um, very minimal involvement in internet governance, like you know, in the contributions and being part of the discussions. And uh, also at least in the discussions at the policy level, there is minimal mention of internet governance activities. But since the pandemic you know, has picked up in the last uh, past months, especially in 2020, then you will now realize that you know, the regulators are also talking about 
internet governance? How do we have to address going forward, especially looking at the regulatory aspect of it? But at the same time, in the Pacific region, um, for example, I think it's, too, it's still too early to start off, where is the right regime you know, to come in and do the regulatory? And I want to give an example. Um, for the Palau, um, I think it's too early to start off with a regulatory into internet governance because there is a need for not just the users, but also the decision makers and even the regulatory to be part of the discussions to understand the scope of internet governance before stepping into the specific internet activities, for example, cybersecurity. And, and then coming back to Vanuatu, for example, yes, there is, an, Andrea has mentioned uh, e-commerce activities that is happening across the region. But at the same time, there is a, a, a not just a call, but it's a flag, you know, raising up, okay, we can move forward with internet, with e-commerce activities. But whether we are prepared with our rules in terms of privacy, for example, whether we are prepared with our cybersecurity rules to guide the e-commerce activities. And interestingly, it's now becoming very crucial in the regulatory discussions in comparison to the last three years ago, um, which is not very much discussed at the regulatory. And I am, I am very pleased to see that happening. Um, it's maybe because of the pandemic, but I think it's more than pandemic. It's also to do with the business and people starting to realize the importance of making online businesses. Um, it's also interesting to see that in some of the, the, the island nations, they're also pushing forward with what sort of framework is, is, is appropriate you know, to, to cater for the e-commerce activities. I'll, I'll give you an example for Vanuatu. So, so Vanuatu came up with a, a national digital governance roadmap. That is an example of you know, the preparation to, to, to welcome the e-commerce businesses. Um, but, but it's not easy because again, you know, it's not every stakeholders understand the overall scope of let's say a digital roadmap, roadmap governance. And, and that is where the challenge is. And that is where people and especially the organizations, for example, I'll give the Ministry of Trade for Vanuatu because Ministry of Trade for Vanuatu is leading e-commerce. Then th there comes this question about the digital governance framework. How do we address this going forward? Who is responsible? Is it under the regulatory? Is it under the, the government the, or the prime minister's office? All these are some of the issues and the questions, the big questions that we are asking each other, especially at the regulatory and policy level. Then at the same time, yes, we, we know that the usage of internet, for example, in terms of meeting uh, is really skyrocketing. But I think it's only to the people that they have proper access to internet. And people in the rural areas, they're still disadvantaged because the access is not that appropriate. It's not reliable. And so they are left behind, okay? So in some of the important information that they require to also be part of. And, and for, for countries like, you know, the island Pacific, I think not, Many of the countries they they experience the let's say the very bad effect of like in, in terms of traveling. I, I'll give you an example in Vanuatu. Okay, yes, we do have the restriction and the borders are closed, but at the national level, we are not restricted. We can travel from one island to another. But because of the economy and because we rely on tourism, we are also impacted to travel from one island to another, which means that we have to have a reliable access to internet in order for us to make use of um, education, of health, of 
tourism activities federally. So, I mean, yes, the pandemic has, you know, given us both positive and negative experiences, but there, there, there are some questions there that how can we work together and help us to move forward. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you so much, um, Dossie. And I think that's that sort of like uh, is a very good segue into um, our final speaker, Alisi, um, who works, you know, with the Pacific Islands Forum, as I mentioned, which is the government side of things, you know, the, the people, the decision makers, and uh, what, you know, how they're um, employing, what their uh, goals are in employing um, ICTs within the region. Um, so over to you, Alisi. You can end our session. I thank you, Maureen, and good evening uh, to everyone, or good morning in my case. Um, thanks again, Maureen, and to Tracy and the um, session coordinators for including Andre and myself in this um, segment. I won't take very long and, uh, in fact, very, very brief, just to really um, add on to what Andre has already said, and more to just, I guess, provide some background to some other complementary work that's going on in ICTs in the Pacific. Um, Maureen, in her introduction, you know, briefly touched on the 2050 strategy. So I guess maybe just very quickly highlight what that is. Um, some years back in 2019, the um, Pacific Forum leaders agreed that, you know, that we needed to um, recommit, I guess, as a region to working together and achieving a renewed vision. Uh, and so they came up with um, the concept to developing a 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific continent. So it's essentially a long-term strategy to ensure the... Um, the future security of the people of the Pacific. Um, and this is being considered in the early part of next year. So there's a draft that's been circulated to our members um, to be endorsed by our leaders next year. And one of the key pillars um, of this strategy is technology and innovation, uh, you know, recognizing that this will be a very important driver of change. And I think if anything, the pandemic and how we have worked, communicated and interacted the last 18 months has really reinforced that as has the, the speakers before me. Um, and I guess we really want to see how, you know, we don't look back or don't turn back uh, and that we need to ensure how, ensure that all efforts, um, you know, going forward are channeled to building on this momentum and the uptake of ICTs, um, the internet and online, you know, online use and activity. Uh, so the development of the 2050 strategy and the, um, the strong links to ICTs and e-commerce is essentially founded on, on the knowledge and recognition of, you know, over several things and over several years of, as, you know, the forum secretary and other regional organizations have undertaken lots of work um, in the ICT space. Um, and I guess one fundamentally has been the growth in emerging technologies, um, which has prompted an accelerated, which has been accelerated by COVID as many of us have, have recognized. Um, and for the Pacific, I think that's really brought to the fore the issues of ICT skills and capacities that's needed across the region, whether it's in the public service or the private sector. Um, you know, and I think that's sort of almost a gap analysis. Where, where can we see where we're doing well and where there are still gaps? Uh, and I think one that comes straight to mind is online learning uh, or online schooling. You know, having seen kids you know, doing face-to-face -face learning and having to shift I think none of us were quite ready for that. So there's still lots of uh, lessons to be learned from that. Um, secondly is, you know, capitalizing on technology for trade, employment and the private sector. That's been so crucial, has been and will continue to be so. And I think the pandemic has really shown us that. We've seen how it's affected supply chains. Um, and Andrea made reference to the Pacific Trade and Invest um, study uh, surveys that come out each month. Mm. And that's something that, you know, some of the listeners might be keen to follow up on as well. But we've definitely seen the supply chains affected and we've seen businesses and customers, um, you know, move to online interface. So that's really brought to the fore the, you know, important work that's being undertaken in e-commerce, uh, for example, how that's really key to a lot of where we're wanting to go here in the region. Uh, but at the same time, while e-commerce focuses on online trading, um, there's other, you know, complementarity policy work that needs to take place more from, I guess, an economic perspective. 
And that's really, I guess, in relation to banks, for example, there's you know, lots of challenges in the Pacific when it comes to uh, digital financial services, you know, internet banking, payment platforms, uh, particularly for businesses and what's available to them. So looking at, you know, uh, ICTs and e-commerce, that's really a big, uh, a big ticket item. Um, we know that financial technologies such as blockchain and um, artificial intelligence, these were some of the issues that were raised at the Pacific IGF in September this year. Um, how they can enhance the you know, efficiency and availability of trade finance, for example, and particularly for SMEs in our region. So we're really looking forward to, the, to working with and collaborating with uh, you know, the network of IGF members across the world who may be able to provide some you know, expertise or support in this area. Mm. Um, thirdly, is that in the absence of national policies, um, there's a big reliance on regional frameworks um, for support. And I think that's where organizations like the forum secretary and other regional agencies, including networks like, um, you know, pick ISOC. Um, the role is important to, to address collective issues. Um, and so in July this year, our forum trade ministers endorsed um, the development of a Pacific regional private sector strategy. That's something that's being developed over the coming months uh, to complement the 2050 strategy. So obviously that's looking at business competitiveness of Pacific businesses. Uh, and looking at exp expanding trade opportunities. But at the heart of this uh, Pacific um, regional private sector strategy will be you know, ICTs, technology and innovation. That'll be really a strong feature going forward. So you know, participating in a forum like this is really um, key for us. Um, fourthly is promoting regional public services using um, you know, digital platforms to reach citizens. And I think that's where the network and support mm -hmm of um, IGF and the work you're doing is really fundamental to the work we're doing um, and complements the work we're doing because it promotes you know, greater participation um, and citizenry, it opens up doors um, for local, national and regional calls to action. Um, so we're really looking forward to seeing how we can uh, work with uh, Maureen and you know, the, the pers uh, people in the countries like Dalsi, for example. Um, and just lastly, Maureen, just to highlight also that the Forum Secretariat has recently re-engaged with ICANN GAC, um, and that's really to better support the, um, the forum members on inter internet governance issues. Um, and this is key to promoting uh, regional public services using digital platforms to reach citizens. So we're looking forward to seeing how we can work with, you know, um, yourselves and people like Save, who I can in Brisbane, and those that are uh, also listening in and are part of that network. Um, so I'll end there, Maureen, and happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Alessi and Cherie, Dulcie and Andrea. Thank you so much for uh, that that very broad perspective of what's happening in the Pacific, and I and I hope that um, this growing number of people who are joining us at the moment, um, you know, sort of like get a good picture, and I think they have got a good picture of you know um, how you know how we're actually sort of like developing, um, and and I, and and as has been mentioned, the the COVID situation and the in, more intense use of the internet has you know probably made more things um, you know happen. Um, than, than, than has in, in the past, um, you know, when we've relied so much on the face-to-face, -face, um, the, you know, the interaction is a lot greater. So I will now pass, uh, pass over to, um, to um, Tracy um, and get the um, Caribbean perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maureen. And so friends and colleagues from the Pacific who have given us a lot to think about, and especially this um, structure approach to doing e-commerce and e-commerce strategies within the Pacific region. I think that's been um, something that we could certainly learn from in the Caribbean, um, but also all of the interventions on what's been happening with PIC-ISOC, Pacific IGF, um, and, and the regulatory environment Adulcy has provided to us as well. I really do appreciate it. And I think that... Um, from where we sit, as I was trying to explain in the in the chat, the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat is analogous to what we have in the Caribbean called CARICOM, which is the Caribbean community. We also there's a secretariat as well, and they also have a series of um, activities and and projects. What's also interesting is that they have a um, a multilateral body which falls within the CARICOM. Um, system, I don't know if that's a word to use, 
called the Caribbean Tele Telecommunications Union, who is dedicated to looking after ICT activities. And we're quite lucky actually to have on our call today, our meeting, we have the Secretary General of the CTU, Rodney Taylor, and we also have Nigel Casimir, who many of you may be aware has been uh, convening the Caribbean IGF over the last, I don't know, it's 16 years accordingly. So um, what I'm going to do without trying to you know, take up too much time and, and summarizing and so on, and I'm hoping that uh, our Pacific colleagues can stay up for this as well. I'm going to ask Rodney, um, I, I think I, I prep Rodney, so maybe he's, whether he's ready to speak. I hope I'm not surprising him. Rodney, if you're willing to, to come on, um, I don't know if your camera's coming on, but certainly if you could come on with your audio mm. to, to give us an introduction and perhaps what you can do is also introduce Nigel to give us um, some aspects of the Caribbean IGF. I'm gonna put Bevel on notice um, to give us some perspectives from the Caribbean on behalf of Aaron and or himself, depending on what approach you'd like to take. So first, Rodney. Go ahead. Thanks, Rodney. Thank you very much, Tracy, for the opportunity to speak very briefly on what is happening uh, from our perspective here in the Caribbean. Um, as you mentioned, the CTU, the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, is the regional intergovernmental body established by CARICOM member states um, initially as far back as 1989 to uh, address issues around telecommunication, the harmonization of telecommunications policy within the CARICOM group of countries. And since then, of course, the technology itself has evolved um, to the point where we are now looking at a, a range of issues. Uh, most recently, of course, the metaverse, which has everybody excited about the new opportunities and, and for, for in particular for small island states. So you mentioned the CIGF, and yes, we have been convening the CIGF for a while. Nigel is on the call and he is, uh, he is Mr. CIGF and um, it is 17 years. And the, we held this year from the, I think 24th and 25th of August. And the theme was in fact around COVID, uh, um, internet governance priorities for post COVID ICT driven development. So yes, COVID has been obviously the dominating uh, force. It has highlighted the deficiencies, the digital divide in particular, uh, impacting our youth in relation to access to education um, because of lack of connectivity or uh, the, the lack of affordability of, of the internet, as well as devices um, and so on, and even digital skills of our teachers. And so there are a number of initiatives that are taking place, but I want to just speak briefly about what were some of the things discussed uh, within the CIGF. We were pleased to be able to establish a partnership with the Alliance for Affordable Internet, A4AI. Um, and we held a, an extensive workshop around issues of affordability and meaningful connectivity. Um, and uh, we highlighted the need for better research to identify the gaps, um, the need to establish affordable and meaningful targets uh, that would help to inform uh, and for policy interventions to help uh, in areas such as device affordability, affordability of data and services, digital skills and content, and focusing on closing the digital gender gap. Um, some of the policy recommendations included a plan um, to have inputs from a diverse and representative set of players across the private sector, public sector, and civil society um, to develop a plan to address these, these gaps, um, to agree on targets across the various countries of, of the CARICOM member states, uh, and to establish funding commitments um, for transparent assessment and review every year. Um, so in, in addition to the, the partnership with the Air 4 AI, we have long-standing partnerships as well with the internet organizations. You mentioned Beva Wooding. We have a long-standing uh, relationship with ARIN, with ICANN, uh, with uh, LACNIC and others, Internet Society, uh, which has been instrumental in driving a lot of the uh, ISOC chapters, obviously, throughout the region. And those chapters have been instrumental also in hosting national uh, internet governance forums. 
And uh, in ISOC has also been instrumental in conducting research to help us understand the connectivity gaps. Um, they have also been advocating for community networks to help bridge the cap, gap for rural uh, communities that have that that don't have uh, a meaningful connectivity. And this is an area that they have even provided funding for NGOs uh, that are interested in doing research or building community networks. Um, we've also been at the CTU in terms of the broader global discussions around uh, internet governance. We've been seeking to strengthen the voice of SIDS. And I'm actually very um, pleased with the work you've done in this area, Tracy, in terms of highlighting and, and building that coalition of SIDS uh, within the IGF. Uh, we are seeking to do the same thing, uh, to build that coalition within, say, the ICANN process, for example. And we have put forward a concept uh, we presented to the um, global um, stakeholder division within ICANN. I've had several conversations with the representative who actually happens to be on the call as well, Mr. Albert Daniels, and how we can increase regional participation within not just the GAC, but within across the ICANN communities. And we recognize that there is significant um, lack of resources. There's a small group of players within the region, and I think the same can be borne out in the Pacific Islands. Uh, and so how can we build um, and how can we strengthen the voice of SIDS uh, we know that there's a mechanism within ICANN, for example, for underserved regions, but it'd be region, but SIDS itself is not considered a region, uh, and therefore special consideration needs to be given based on research uh, and to how we can improve. And ICANN recognizes, um, while I can't speak on the behalf, there is a st strategic plan that does acknowledge that there is, there is a risk um, to the multi-stakeholder model if, in fact, uh, small island developing states don't have a voice in the table or at the table for whatever reason, um, lack of resources, lack of interest, whatever the reason is, there is still a risk, and we need to address that risk if we are to have meaningful participation um, of small island developing states. Um, Nigel, if you are on um, and you want to fill any gaps that I have I've left out, yeah. and I'm conscious of the time as well, so yeah, that sort of is a broad overview of where we are at the moment. Yes, I am on. Um, I, I'll, I'll just maybe say a few more words about the CIGF, the Caribbean Internet Governance Forum, which got going in September of 2005, actually, and we've been running it annually ever since. And we, we had our 17th forum, 24th and 25th of August, as Rodney said. And over the years, we've kind of developed, I guess, a formula for the IGF, for, for, for the CIGF, which basically um, allows for uh, information sharing among uh, different organizations within the Caribbean, different I national IGFs within the Caribbean and also with the UN IGF and um, the LAC IGF as the case might be. So there's a session related to that. We, and we also are most proud, I think, of our, our key product out of the CIGF, which is the Caribbean Internet Governance Policy Framework, um, an overview framework that articulates a, a vision a mission and um, policy uh, priorities for, 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 for the Caribbean and internet governance. So part of the work of each CIGF is to update this as developments progress year after year. So we did have, so we always have at least one workshop related to that. Um, another workshop we had involved the internet organizations in the Caribbean, the, the ICANN, ISOC, ARIN, LACNIC that, that uh, have been mentioned, to look at, um, say, data, developing uh, internet data, data sets for, for the Caribbean, for the development of that. And there is follow-up action going on in that regard. Part of the work is also to deal with uh, what we see as the hot topics and in internet governance at the time, and Rodney made mention of those. And um, we realized a need to keep the work going in between our, our forum, notwithstanding that the, the forum is the main uh, uh, what, consensus confirmation um, effort that we have. We've also established an, an online discussion forum on the CTU website. Um, we have some work to do in terms of getting it as vibrant as we want it to be. And we do have some, some capacity availability challenges there that 
we are working on in the very short term. So um, hopefully we'll be in a situation whereby, in addition to the annual forum, we'll have uh, internet governance discussions going on and progressing um, throughout the Caribbean uh, in, the, in the intervening periods. So I'll stop there for, for the moment. Thank you very much, Nigel, and thank you very much, um, S.G. Rodney. Um, <laughs> Rodney is such a, a colleague of ours that it's a challenge to call Rodney S.G., but I, I think <laughs> I have to give him the, the, the respect that he deserves. <laughs> um, yeah, so S.G. Rodney, I think that's a nice hybrid of the <laughs> two. Thank you very much for that um, very, very, I think, very thoughtful um, perspective on more, how we can work both in the Caribbean and together, um, as said, in terms of trying to understand each other um, in multiple fora, as, as Rodney said, perhaps in the ICANN fora, we need to do a little more than just be there. But certainly, you know, you know, there's strength in numbers. And certainly if we want to um, have our voices heard in, in this internet governance space, um, showing up in greater numbers, um, as a, as a collective, as uh, small development states, is a good opportunity. And for Nigel, in terms of the Caribbean IGF, I think that, uh, as you said, the 17th year, for those just, you know, we keep saying it, that the Caribbean IGF was in fact the first IGF, even before the global IGF, it was, the, it was held before the actual first global IGF. I'm not sure if many people know that. And um, so that's why it's 17th, whereas I think we're on the 16th IGF in the, in the global IGF. Um, and that Caribbean IGF has been really working hard, given the challenges. I know the Pacific IGF has the same challenges to sort of bridge the divide across the, the, the islands. And the approach that, like the Pacific IGF, the CIGF has taken is to try and do the IGF in an island, I guess this is pre-COVID, in a particular country. And, you know, um, where possible, bring others or experts from other islands into that country when it's happening, and but really focus on that country and their expertise at that point of time, bring in remote participation when necessary, but then share the knowledge and, and expertise thereafter with the various outputs and outcomes that are come out of it. I think one of the things that we've talked about before that I think has um, we need ready to activate is something akin to SIDS IGF. I don't, I don't know, make it sound ridiculous, but you know, we are, this is, this is what we're doing here is effectively the start of it. And it'd be really useful if we could sort of co-locate, perhaps even within the UN IGF or maybe separately, uh, a, a way to, part, to, to collaborate across the water. Because as many of you are aware and are hearing, our challenges and concerns are very similar across um, geographies. So it's not just about geography, it's about common um, historical backgrounds, common economic, um, background shared experiences. And I think that's something we need to, to push forward and, and really tie that together. Unfortunately, the pandemic has created the, the challenge in working um, in terms of how our modalities are not working as well as they probably should. But given that we are working remotely, um, we probably should use the opportunity to, to do this more um, and, and, and not just talk about it. Maybe we should just do it. And then maybe I'm going to reach out given that we have folks from the Pacific Islands Forum and from the CTU here, perhaps this is a good opportunity for you to, to touch base with each other and maybe you know, work with the DC SIDS to get something like this going. Yep, and Rodney is saying, I see he's in the chat, SIDS IGF 2022, come count me in. I think that's, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I wanna, I wanna hear an amen from the Pacific, let's see. <laughs> Um, Bevel, I know I put Bevel on alert, and I think um, Nigel and Rodney put Albert on alert. So I think what we can probably do now um, is get some in, some insight from Bevel and Albert, and then after that, what I would propose that we do is open the floor to have input from the wider um, DC SIDS roundtable. And I also asked June if there, I know June has said there's some people in the room and which is quite interesting at, at Katowice. 
if there are any questions or, or inputs from the room as well. So first I'll let's maybe hand over to Bevel um, for his inputs and then Albert, perhaps you can jump straight in after without me having to introduce you. You can probably introduce yourselves. Go ahead, guys. Uh, good day all, uh, good night, good evening, good morning. Uh, I, I wanted to just start by endorsing that idea for uh, some form uh, or forum for this discussion to, to go even deeper. So much of what has been shared by the, the Pacific colleagues um, resonates extremely well with us here in the Caribbean. The, these are common experiences and, um, and these are also common models that, um, that apply perfectly to the dynamics that we are seeing across the region. Um, one of the things that, that I think everyone will, will recognize is how much the, the pandemic has put a spotlight on the work that we've been doing over the past many years. And um, there is a, a far greater appetite for coordinated approaches because of what has been exposed in terms of the, the gaps that exist, in terms of the vulnerabilities that we are subject to. And I think also in terms of the fact that uh, when it comes down to it, the resilience and security depends on local or indigenous capacity development. And um, one of the, 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 the travel restrictions really emphasize the fact that we need more persons on the ground capable of building, managing, and maintaining uh, the systems that are essential for digital economies and knowledge-based societies. And I, I think that's a good thing because it means that the work that we have done over the years now has, uh, you, can, you can say now has found its time and its place. And I, I just want to use that to give a, an update on some of the, the areas where either as Aaron, the American Registry for Internet Numbers, and I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if Kevin, my colleague from LACNIC is on the call, where we've been seeing certain developments, um, but I also want to share some of the, the interesting things happening in some of the other related areas. Uh, SG Rodney would have um, put his finger on the, the increasing collaborations between the regional internet uh, registries, ICANN, ISOC, um, and some of the, the regional bodies like Caribnog and the Caribbean Pairing Forum to ensure that uh, there is a, a coordinated approach going forward. Uh, there are four things that, that I see as emphases uh, that are, I think, noteworthy for this, this conversation. Uh, one is the emphasis on research uh, and the recognition that the, the, the way to engage stakeholders who may have up to this point been ambivalent or that's outright unconcerned, uh, is to put in front of them the numbers, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, um, an indication of the state of, of, of the Caribbean internet, which was the name of a symposium that we kicked off in 2019, just before the pandemic, that was intended to trigger um, very specific research on areas of, of internet and internet development and internet governance. Uh, using Caribbean models, but based on international practices, um, most notably the OECD's um, digital uh, um, agenda um, framework for research. Uh, that exercise is now in the hands of, I think, between the CTU and some of its regional partners. And the idea is that we would be um, taking a very deliberate effort in the coming year um, to put out some of the, the research material and some of the findings to better inform um, decision making. Uh, I, I think we've gotten to the point in the, in the Caribbean where um, the same story is on repeat, uh, the same messages are, are on a recurring cycle, and now um, the trigger, uh, if we have to build on the attention that COVID has brought, the trigger has to be some very clear um, metrics that define the next step of regional action. Uh, the second emphasis that I've, I've seen, um, this is on all fronts, whether it is uh, the RIR looking and listening to the um, the noises coming out of the, the technical community or on the public policy side, listening to the, the conversations um, amongst governments in the region. Um, there is a, a renewed interest in funding and financing mechanisms for supporting innovation or ITT-based ecosystems. Um, there's no shortage of ideas, business ideas, um, product and, and digital service ideas. What there is, is a, a glaring lack of a, of the supporting environment for those ideas to really take root and to grow into proper full and sustainable enterprises. And so um, the UN ECLAC, um, CTU again, um, as well as some of the, 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 the banks, the, the central banks in the region are looking very particularly at this issue of 
uh, funding innovation ecosystems. And I think that's a, a very important development uh, that is taking place. There's a report that is due out at the end of this year um, that will indicate some of the findings of uh, one of the surveys that were done. Um, but again, listening to the, the, the reports coming out of the Pacific, I do not believe that those findings will be fundamentally different from the, the findings that came out of similar studies in the Pacific, nor do I believe that the recommendations will vary widely from those recommendations that we heard earlier. Uh, this is one of those areas in which the, 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 the innovators will innovate, but they cannot create public policy. They cannot um, mobilize the levels of funding necessary to build and establish those kinds of businesses. And so um, this issue of the emphasis on funding and financing ecosystems, I think is a very positive step um, that we're seeing coming out, not just of the financial services sector, but out of the, the, the governments as well. Uh, the, the third and fourth areas uh, would be very common to all. Uh, one is the emphasis on capacity development, the shortage of, of um, skilled, uh, particularly digitally literate uh, workers to support this, this accelerated movement to online everything, online services, online schools, online businesses, et cetera, um, has really put that spotlight on it. And of course, that spotlight, when you shine it, goes straight down into the education system. And we have seen in the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the OECS, we've seen a very specific um, and, and now over one year um, of consultations looking at what needs to happen all the way to primary school level if we have to create the, the generation capable of stewarding and, um, and leading our digital charge into the future. Um, but of course, it also affects the, the work that Caribnog is doing with the technical community, that the CTU is doing with its member states. Um, and the idea is that capacity development is not just technical skills, it's also awareness, it's leadership awareness, it's, it's um, understanding how the dots connect, it's understanding what the overlapping areas are. And that work and the design of those capacity developing um, development programs are not the purview of any one organization. But having a conversation like the one we're having here helps the various groups to synchronize their approaches. And I think that's the, 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 the thing that I'm seeing emerging is at least the, the, the inclination or the desire to be more synchronized in the approach to tackling some of these, these complex and nuanced issues. And then the last, um, the last area I want to put my, um, and a finger on in terms of emerging um, or renewed emphasis is the emphasis on internet infrastructure. Uh, this is a common one for this group. We've, we've spoken for years about the importance of critical internet infrastructure located within our regions, internet exchange points, autonomous networks, et cetera. And, uh, and we are at that point where we are in a, what we can call our, our second or third wave of emphasis on internet infrastructure. Uh, there is a massive push now to, to look at existing internet exchange points and to create new internet exchange points. There is an interest in optimizing the interconnection agreements uh, between not just the commercial internet service providers, but also introducing new players, non-commercial network operators into the mix so that content and digital services can be more effectively moved within countries and across the region. And again, I think this is an excellent uh, development that we're seeing. Uh, more work obviously needs to be done, but the, the process is thankfully on the way. And again, spearheading it would be organizations like the CTU, like Caribnog, like Carpet, and, and with the support of the regional internet registries and the other IORGs that, um, that do their business in the region. So I, I think if you, if you are to some of these emphases, what you can see is a greater recognition of the need for more integrated approaches uh, toward internet and um, internet development, and more generally toward development because internet development is, is designed and is supposed to facilitate that greater region-wide development. And we are seeing that recognition translating itself into greater interest at the ministerial level, at the regulatory level, at the private sector level, and among civil society. So I just wanted to bring those, um, those, those, those trends that we've seen over the last 12 to uh, 18 months um, here in the region to you, and to um, again endorse the, the benefit of this forum for sharing ideas and exchanging experiences. Thank you. Thanks, Bevel. Um, and before I go to Albert, um, and I just want, there's someone in, in, in Katowice who wanted to intervene. So before we, we sum up what you said and go to Albert, and then I know Deidre has a question. I mean, I could toss to June and, and Katowice, and there's someone, yes, someone waiting to speak at, um, 
Yes, I think I'm seeing him on the screen. Yes, go ahead. Um, introduce yourself. I don't know if the mic's open, so go ahead. The mic's not open on our side. We can't hear you. Can the tech team open the mic for um, the room, please? The, the, the room on site. Let's make this hybrid event work, please, if you yeah. don't mind. Good, we're hearing you now, thanks. Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for hosting this session. I'm uh, very, very happy to, to attend. I'm from Africa and uh, uh, I think that we also have the same issue uh, with uh, you people in the Cara Caribbean. And what maybe I will suggest is if it's possible to uh, like build a bridge between us, uh, Caribbean and Africa on some uh, specific issue, uh, which are common to all of us. Um, that uh, was uh, my contribution. I don't have many, many things to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just can just say who? who yeah. Uh, my name is, uh, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Donat Bukasakanda from DRC. Uh, right, thank yes, you very I'm, much. Uh, members of the civil society group and members of African group uh, in, in, on EGF. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you can certainly reach out to us, um, the DC SIDS, and um, that would be a great opportunity, I think. And uh, you have June. You can give June your contact information. She could share with us. Thank you so much. Um, so, so is there anyone else on the floor, um, on the floor June? Someone else wants to say something? Okay, let's let's yeah, let's let's do the hybrid thing and involve our. Interestingly enough, the remote has over, overshadowed on site for a change. So let's see what I, if there's on site. Yes. Uh, hello. My, yes. Yes. My oh. name is Amado Espinosa from Mexico, and also uh, representing the. RULAC region here at the IGA from the private sector. And uh, certainly for us, it's a great pleasure to, to hear how active uh, are you uh, right now at the Caribbean and how you are facing the different challenges that you uh, have there. And of course, we, we are looking forward to uh, build up a prosperous region here, which voice can be heard at these levels, at these levels of discussions. And yes, as one of our colleagues mentioned, uh, uh, this is an, an important opportunity for us to not only to learn from, from best practices uh, already ongoing in, at the EU or at the, uh, in North America, but also um, how our realities and how the perspectives of our economies uh, can be represented in this decision-making process of um, uh, data framing, data regulations, platform regulations, cybersecurity, um, digital human rights, uh, how to uh, support for the deployment of uh, infrastructure and so on. And just by keeping together and exchanging this kind of experiences, I think it's the only way how can we make it possible to succeed as a group. Thank you. Thank you very much for Mexico, sir. And um, yeah, I really appreciate that intervention. And I think the, uh, the message really is collaboration and sharing and really trying to find a way to, as you said, build those bridges. And that's sort of echoing what Bevel, um, so just linking back to Bevel, uh, what Bevel said, oh, there's the room. That's interesting. <laughs> it's a hybrid room. So linking back to what Bevel said in terms of the um, overall way we need to work together and um, the fact that the commonalities are very clear. Um, it's entirely possible, as Bevel has quite rightly suggested, that the reports are going to look very similar when you produce them on paper. The research <clears throat> frames, the, the challenges, and hopefully the solutions. So why do we do all of these things independently? We certainly need to work together and share this. And as we said before, there's a, there's a, a significant strength in numbers. And I think if we forge this relationship across um, our, our countries, um, as has been happening on the climate side for, for the SEDS, um, on the IG side, I think we're gonna really be um, a force to reckon with. And we can share knowledge, expertise, and experiences. And as Rodney was saying earlier, 
in terms of getting these voices heard and to avoid the fatigue of the individuals who are currently, you know, in the, in the trenches doing the work. I know Carlton's here and Carlton has been um, speaking about this for, se for several years. We can get that wider base to get the message across and to get the inputs in, um, both from a wider catchment pool, from a deeper pool, and certainly from the newer members that may come up through that pool. Um, I know Deirdre wanted to go next. So before I toss to Albert, so Deirdre, um, I know you had something to intervene with. So Deirdre, please proceed if, if you can. Deirdre is, is not in Katowice. I think Deirdre is online. So Deirdre, go no. ahead. Deirdre is in St. Lucia. Deirdre is speaking from a civil society point of view. And Deirdre wants to remind people of the ones who are being left out in St. Lucia, we have an old calypso about, I go sing for the Malaway, and I go sing for the Malaway. Dalcy mentioned them, they exist in the Pacific as well. They don't have a voice in this particular space because very often they don't have technological capability. And the fact that they can't keep up at school because they don't have a device or the internet breaks down or it has begun to be something that doesn't matter and it does matter, it matters a lot. So um, I, I go back a long way. So I go back to Joni Mitchell in the 1960s and looking at things from both sides now, could we please, please remember to look at the technology from both sides so that we see the bad things as well as the good things? And can we please balance the whole world together in our perspective? Zoom is wonderful, Facebook, um, social media is wonderful, everything is wonderful, and it uses an awful lot of electricity and an awful lot of power. And we don't seem to think about that. We want the classes to be, let's do classes on Zoom, let's jump online with our teaching. I'm a teacher, it doesn't work. You can't just jump online. So I think my question is, how much is this group in SIDS keeping in mind it's Malawi? And for those who don't speak Creole, the Malawi are the disadvantaged of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deirdre. And um, yes, I know Deirdre has, she has been speaking about this for, for several years in terms of those who are, you know, we talk about as a group that we are um, underserved as you know, SIDS as islands, but certainly within our own countries, there's quite a substantial um, digital inclusion problem that we need to, to solve, a digital literacy problem as well. And of course, the, the physical issues with infrastructure and devices and essentially skills. So I think that's something that in the SIDS IGF that we talk about, maybe that's something we really need to, to put on the table as, as a way to, to solve that. How do we solve those problems? Um, time is running rapidly out on us and I do want to take as many inputs as we possibly can, um, but I do know I had Albert on standby. So um, Albert. Um, Thank you very much, Tracy. Hello everyone. Good morning, good day, good evening. I am Albert Daniels, the Global Stakeholder Engagement uh, Representative from ICANN the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and I cover the Caribbean. Like Deirdre, I'm also in St. Lucia right now, so I can very highly uh, relate to the situation of what we refer to as the, the Malawi. And I think it's interesting that that comment came because from an ICANN perspective, and I'm sure from other international organizations, we can look at the Malawi as some of those voices which are, are not being heard as, as far as, as, as they can be currently. We, we note at ICANN the, the similarity in challenges between uh, the different territories of the SIDS, the Caribbean, the Pacific, and, and Africa. We also note the opportunities that SIDS have to influence policy 
by having their voices get to the next higher level. At ICANN, you know, we have a very uh, specific uh, focus on names and numbers, but we also have the focus of trying to get uh, the, the voices which have not been heard to impact on policy. And as Rodney quite, uh, as you Rodney quite, quite correctly pointed out, there is a risk that if these voices do not speak, then the very legitimacy of policy can be questioned, which is why we are always looking out to see how we can increase the diversity of voices that come into the overall discussions. And we are seeing an increasing move towards this group as SIDS having their own distinguished recognized voice, particularly within ICANN. ICANN uh, likes to be seen as a very uh, responsive and sensitive uh, entity to the voice of stakeholders. And coming out of some comments in our recent meetings, the last two meetings, we are now on a very specific project where we're collaborating with the CTU to see how we can get the voices of the small island development states to feature more highly and more effectively within the, the ICANN context. This is a project which has the visibility at the highest level in ICANN, and I'm talking about the chairman of the board, the vice presidents for Africa, vice presidents for the Pacific region, and also the vice president for Latin America and the Caribbean. And the first step that we are embarking on right now is to do a little bit of that research that Bevel spoke about in identifying clearly, you know, what are some of the challenges that stakeholders from the SIDS have in participating in ICANN? Uh, what are some of the opportunities? What are the areas of interest? So we are at the stage where uh, we are working with uh, the Caribbean Telecommunications Union to uh, issue a sort of survey, get some hard data on what these uh, areas and key points are so that we can then craft actions which hopefully will chart a path for getting small island development states to, to be a little bit more active in ICANN and a little bit more recognized uh, through collaboration in what is actually going on. Alisi made a comment in the chat about opportunities for collaboration between Caribbean, African and Pacific territories. And it is within this sort of vein that we are now embarking on this new project with uh, SG Rodney. I hope I said it correctly, Rodney, SG Rodney. Uh, following Tracy's example. So we are looking forward in ICANN to this, this new era in SID's participation within the ICANN community, which I suspect will benefit other areas where the SIDs are participating in as well. So thank you, Tracy, for the opportunity for these few uh, words. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Albert. And I really think that's, that's a, a good, really good start for perhaps some structured um, SIDs work in these spaces that um, move out of this, the IGF space and into others. And I'm happy that DC SIDS has in some way catalyzed this. And I, I will, I think Maria and I will take some, will take some of that um, credit for, for ensuring that we, <laughs> we get this to move. Um, Maureen, um, I want to toss back to you so that you can sort of, kind of give us off some final remarks and close it off. Um, I know there may have been one or two other um, inputs coming in from the room. So if anybody comes in while you're speaking, perhaps you can um, feel those as well. We have about three minutes left, Maureen. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And the discussion um, has, been, um, has been superb. I think this has probably been one of the most interesting and most probably the most diverse of the discussions we've ever had within uh, within this, and I think that um, you know, uh, I, I, I was very pleased to actually sort of like get the uh, contributions not only from the grassroots with the uh, internet societies, but similarly with um, you know that right through to um, through to government, uh, you know, like I mean, what are your governments doing in your in the um, in your in your regions and um, as we are within um, within uh, the Pacific, but this is the first time we've actually had some you know had had that that input from government level. And I'm so pleased that Alessi was able to sort of like provide us with you know like I mean what are our we knew we've always known that our governments met. I mean just as uh, I'm sure your um, was it the Caricom or something that is your uh, government uh, sort of like a government uh, group. Um, yeah, we've always known that they met. We just didn't know what they actually sort of like spoke about. So, 
um, you know, being able to have that input into this has been absolutely superb. And the biggest takeaway that I've got, and I'm sure Tracy and I will definitely work on it with, um, um, you know, with the um, Pacific IGF and the, um, and the uh, Caribbean IGF, um, you know, there must be some way in which we can actually sort of like get some sort of like collaboration going because, you know, as you say, we've, there, are common, there are common issues and, um, you know, it's really important that we sort of like look at uh, how, we can, how we can actually make, uh, you know, like, I mean, the IGF isn't a place for sort of like solving the, the issues of the world. Um, or coming up with any sort of, but you know, if there is probably one thing that we will, you know, definitely take away is that we must meet more regularly. Uh, we must actually sort of engage on specifics. Um, and there are so many things that have come up. And I'm, I'm, I, I sort of feel for 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 Dee with her, um, you know, her concerns. And I know that they've been, you know, for years. You know, the concerns are how do we address the needs of the people who are the disadvantaged groups. And we have so many within our Pacific communities. Um, so we need to sort of like, you know, that's got to be a focus area for us. Um, and education and health and all the other, you know, the, the um, access uh, to the technologies and that, that we're actually expecting people to use, um, but we're not giving them the wherewithal to do it. So, I mean, that's my, those are my takeaways anyway. Trace, unless you want to add some a final in the final second. I think we're going to get cut off very shortly by our <laughs> tech team. So quickly, can we um, um, do, our, do our group photos? So for those who are in a position to put up their cameras, let's throw it on. Let's try and get some of this. Um, um, let's try and do a hybrid photo. Yes, straighten up, nice up, large up. Yeah. Let's try this. Let's see if that's going to work um, to get a photo done for us. Um, how do we do this on my machine? I don't even know. Oh, yes, I'm getting something working here. Yeah, so I got one. Yeah, another one. Smile, everybody. Take a take smile. Smile. I'm, doing, I'm taking the picture. Cool. All right. I think I got a picture of those, of those who seem to have their cameras on. Um, so I would like to thank everyone for joining us today and for... Um, really participating fully in our session and really, uh, I think this is Maureen said, one of our most diverse opportunities that we had, including we, we got some um, great government slash IGO um, interpretations and I think that support. So we're gonna be calling upon you. So uh, don't, don't worry. Uh, we know we, we brought you here, so we're gonna keep you we here. We know where you live. Yeah. We're gonna keep you here. <laughs> and we're gonna, and let's assume that um, the next IGF is in Ethiopia, for those who don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Since the IGF 2022 in Ethiopia, who knows? Who knows? Let's see how it goes. Thanks again, everyone. And do have a pleasant rest of your day. And for those in the Pacific, sleep well. Thank you for staying <laughs> up. Thanks again. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.